Our first speaker is Dr. Jonathan Chung from University of Chicago, and he'll be talking on updated HRCT diagnostic categories, rationale for change. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Well, thanks for the kind introduction, and uh, thank you for the PFF for having me. My first summit, I'm really, really excited to be here. And so if there are any other radiologists out here, I think uh, not too many, um, you know, go ahead and uh, clap when I make jokes and you know, laugh and do whatever to make me feel as, much, as comfortable as possible, hopefully. Uh, so we have a lot to cover, so let's go ahead and get started. These are my disclosures, none of which are directly pertinent to this talk. So the gist of this talk really is, how do we go from here 2011 multi-sided guidelines where we had a, we had a three-tier UIP CT classification system, UIP, possible UIP, and inconsistent with UIP, and then in 2018 go to this. We had essentially a four-tier system. So shown here, these are the multi-society guidelines, UIP, probable UIP, indeterminate for UIP, and alternative diagnosis. And as most of you probably know, there is also Fleischner Society white paper guidelines, which describes essentially very similar classification system. I think essentially for all intents and purposes, almost exactly the same. And for the purpose of this talk, let's just say they're nearly exactly the same. Okay, so really it's a story here. Um, so the, the areas labeled in blue are really the areas that we're gonna focus on, because those, those are the major changes from the old guidelines to the new guidelines. It actually pains me to say it, but we're not gonna really talk about UIP pattern on CT or, or the typical UIP pattern if you follow the Fleischner lexicon. And so it pains me to say that because that's actually where I am most useful to you as a clin to the clinician, to probably to most of the people in the audience. Because when I say something is UIP on CT, if I say, you know, I'll eat my hat if it's not UIP on CT, almost always, over 95% of the time, it's gonna be UIP on pathology. And so that's actually where I shine. But unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, it hasn't changed at all. So if you knew what UIP was in 2011, you know what UIP is in 2018, and obviously now in 2019 as well. It really has not changed. Peripheral basal predominant pulmonary fibrosis, with reticulation, with subpleural honeycombing. No other findings that suggest an alternative diagnosis. That's UIP. So the three things that we are gonna talk about are gonna be, are shown here, the things that are, are shown in blue. So number one, possible UIP from the previous guidelines became probable UIP, again, for all intents and purposes. The inconsistent with UIP pattern from the old guidelines now is called non-IPF diagnosis or alternative diagnosis, depending on who you're reading. And then there was a creation of a fourth category, the CT pattern indeterminate for UIP. So these are the three things that we're really gonna focus on. And so kind of trying to explain uh, the rationale, why, why it makes sense for these changes to have happened. So let's talk about probable UIP first, formerly known as possible UIP. And this is a pretty classic example of probable UIP on HRCT. We have peripheral, basal predominant pulmonary fibrosis, characterized by reticulation, with some mild traction bronchiectasis and bronchiectasis at the lung bases, but no evidence of subpleural honeycombing. Also, no findings to suggest an alternative diagnosis, which is very important. If you look at the literature um, in these patients who have a po formerly possible UIP pattern, now again, we would call probable UIP pattern, we see that the diagnostic yield for UIP and pathology is somewhere in the 80 to 90% range. And if you're older than 60, that's above 90%. So what I'm saying is, if someone has this pattern, possible or probable UIP pattern on CT, now that we, we call it probable UIP, 89% of the time you're gonna have UIP and pathology, and if you're older than 60, over 90% of the time you're gonna have UIP and pathology. And that's important. And so, you know, I, I've always thought this, and I think that is, it is true, words are very powerful, words are very important. So in, in this study, in the Harvard Business Review, these uh, researchers uh, actually went out to the community and they talked to like 1,700 people, a lot of people, just random people. Uh, lay people, and they ask them, if I give you this descriptive word, what does it mean to you? What do you think is the likelihood of probability? So if you look at the top there, always, if someone says always, then nearly everyone thinks that's 100% probability. If you look in the bottom row there, never, nearly 100% of people think that there's essentially 0% probability. But let's look at possible, word possible. So if you look at possible, there is this very, very 
you know, spread out sort of distribution of what people think. And if you look at the median, it's probably some in the 40% range. So possible as a descriptor really does not jive with what the diagnostic ramifications are of this pattern. I told you 80, 90% of the time, it's gonna be UIPN pathology. Possible makes no sense. That actually is not a great descriptor. Now, so let's look at probable, or probably. So here, if you look at the median, the median is somewhere around 70%. So this is actually a much more appropriate term, probable, rather than possible UIP, to describe the diagnostic ramifications of this imaging pattern. Uh, it's not perfect, though. Actually, the perfect one, if you kind of look, probably hard for you guys to see in the back of the room, but the, the, the perfect one would have been usual. But for obvious purposes, we're not going to call this usual, usual interstitial pneumonia, right? That just would be ludicrous. So anyways, we're stuck with probable, but probable is much better than possible in regards to a descriptor. And as I said before, um, this is, words are important. Words are powerful. It kind of changes your mindset. So indeed, if you read the Fleischner Society white paper, they say now that if you have someone with a high pretest probability of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and you either have a classic UIP pattern, that pattern that I was talking about, I will eat my hat if it's not UIP, right? You know, that kind of pattern. Or if you have a probable UIP pattern CT, you don't need to biopsy those patients to achieve a diagnosis of IPF. That's very important. Remember, using the previous 2011 multi-society guidelines, Someone who had a possible UIP pattern, which again is the same thing as a probable UIP pattern for all intents and purposes, we biopsy those patients. So we all know in the room, in this room, that surgical lung biopsy is associated with significant morbidity and mortality for patients, and obviously patient discomfort as well. That shouldn't be discounted. Pain in patients should not be discounted. So if you can achieve a confident diagnosis without having to go through surgical lung biopsy, that is the path to take. And that's why this probable UIP idea is very important. If you read the multi-society guidelines, and, I, and when I say read, I mean like you know, you're, you're reading it while you're watching television, right? You're not really like paying that much attention, you're just kind of like skimming it. On surface level, you may think that the multi-society guidelines say that a probable UIP pattern on CT, these patients still you need to biopsy them. But if you look, um, it's actually a conditional recommendation there with a very low quality of evidence. So if you talk to the authors of, these multi of the multi-society guidelines, some of the main authors, and read um, at least one of their multiple editorials on this topic, you'll see that they actually agree with the Fleischner Society guidelines in the sense that if you have someone who has a high pretest probability of IPF and they have a probable UIP pattern on CT, you've essentially obviated surgical lung biopsy. They agree, they actually agree. Uh, so I think we put that to rest. So now we have this idea of a probable UIP pattern on CT being extremely powerful essentially having the same diagnostic ramifications as a classic UIP pattern in a someone who has a high pretest probability of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So that's one of the big changes. So possible UIP essentially being transformed into probable UIP. Okay, so that's number one. That was the big change. Here's another change. Let's now talk about the inconsistency with UIP terminology, essentially being turned into the alternative or non-IPF diagnostic category. So I think the issue with the inconsistent with UIP pattern was that when someone hears inconsistent with UIP, what do they think? They think it's not going to be UIP. That's not actually true. You have to, if you actually look at these patients, when you look at the data for these patients who had an inconsistent with UIP pattern, a significant minority, if not up to half of these patients, actually end up having UIP on pathology. Okay? So that terminology actually was, was uh, misleading, right? So it, it was not conveying the actual diagnostic, from a pathological standpoint, ramifications of this imaging pattern. That's important. So, and, and this is due to the fact that there are these things called, um, I like to call them, or right, I think other people call them this as well, atypical UIP cases on high resolution chest CT. So what is that? It's cases that don't look like UIP on CT, but on biopsy, they turn out to be UIP. This pattern though, is still suggestive of an alternative non-IPF clinical diagnosis, right? So, so the, the path may show UIP doesn't mean it's automatically IPF. Remember, I know, again, everyone in the room knows this, but the, the gold standard in diagnosis in interstitial lung disease is not pathology, but it is multidisciplinary discussion. So in this disease category, the one all the way on the right, the, the one the disease imaging category that is least suggestive of UIP, least suggestive of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, there's been a subtle switch from using a pathological standard to more of a clinical standard 
which actually makes sense if you think about it, given the, that this disease category or this imaging category, the alternative diagnosis or non-IPF diagnosis category, formerly known as inconsistent with UIP, is actually very, very, very heterogeneous. There are all sorts of things in there. There's NSIP in there, there's sarcoid in there, connective tissue disease in there, there's cystic lung disease in there, all sorts of different things in there. So it actually sort of makes sense to make this subtle shift from a pathological standard to more of a clinical standard. So a lot of data here, uh, but I just really want you to focus on that bottom row. This is, uh, this is the, uh, data from National Jewish. Uh, if you look at the bottom row there, those are patients in whom we looked at CT scans and we thought this does not look like UIP. This looks like NSIP or this looks like HP. And so it was scored as such. 40% of those cases ended up being UIP and pathology. You might think to yourself, wow, 40%, that seems like a very high rate for this atypical UIP on HRCT, but I'll, I'll, I'll show you the literature, it actually falls right in the middle. Here's some case examples taken from that. Uh, so here, this was scored as NSIP on HRCT. It's admittedly a difficult pattern. Clearly, there is ground glass opacity, but there's superimposed reticulation. The zonal distribution is kind of all over the place. Is it diffuse? I'm not, it's really hard to put your finger on exactly what's going on. Maybe there's some areas of even subcortical uh, sub sparing. Again, very hard to categorize, but ultimately it was called NSIP. Pathology came back UIP. Obviously, we're not going to say that this is automatically an, a, a case of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. This patient has to be diagnosed based on multidisciplinary discussion. Another example here. On the left, we have our inspiratory image. On the right, we have an expiratory image. So the, the right-sided expiratory image shows florid air trapping. And I think even with the lights up a little bit, I think you can see the, the severe degree of air trapping within the lung parenchyma. So based on that, this pattern was called hypersensitive pneumonitis on high-resolution chest CT, but PATH came back UIP. But in the setting of multidisciplinary discussion, I really would stick to my guns. I would push hard for this being hypersensitive pneumonitis, regardless of what the pathology showed. Right? I would say, well, as a patient even seen an environmental hygienist, right? I would probably go that far because of the imaging pattern being so suggestive of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So there's that. So again, inconsistent with UIP, kind of a misnomer. Uh, so I told you that I was going to talk about atypical UIP cases in HRCT in regards to the literature. Uh, so at National, in National Jewish, the atypical UIP rate was around 40%. And again, that sounds high. But if you look at the literature, that actually falls right in the middle. Svegelati in 2010 and Silva in 2008 uh, talked about their atypical UIP cases, and Spezzolati showed a 62% case rate of atypical UIP cases on HRCT, and Silva showed a 25% rate. So we're right in the middle. 40% was right in the middle there. So uh, again, if you have that pattern, if you have that disease pattern, which again is suggestive of something else, something other than UIP, still a little less than half the time it's going to be UIP and pathology. But doesn't mean that it's automatically IPF, really. Multidisciplinary discussion is the gold standard in this setting. Okay, so we talked about that. We talked about the transformation of that terminology from inconsistent uh, UIP to either alternative diagnosis or non-IPF diagnosis. Now let's talk about indeterminate for UIP on CT. So this is a brand new category in the UIP CT classification system. And you know what? I love it. I'm really, really happy that it's here. So in the previous guidelines in 2011, there was no place for hard cases, and hard because either disease was very mild or the, the imaging patterns, it really didn't fit any of the other, uh, any well-defined imaging patterns that we, we had. And so if you look at the literature, they say anywhere from 10 to 30 percent of cases are hard to categorize definitively. I think in actual clinical practice, it's probably closer to 10 percent, one out of 10, or maybe one out of eight cases are hard to categorize. It comes over on my packs and I kind of throw up my hands and say, I'm not really sure what this is, but this is what the literature says. And so using the previous guidelines, there was a tendency to actually miscategorize these, to do the exact wrong thing with these cases. And so it's just human nature. So if you had a hard case, if you had a hard case, and you had a, a three-tier classification system, UIP, possible UIP in the middle, inconsistent UIP on the other side, and you had a hard case and didn't know where to put it, where would you put it? Would you put it on the extreme? No, we're humans, right? Humans, we like to hedge, we like to say, you know, mild to moderate instead of mild or moderate, right? We put, we shove that thing in the middle. So um, I think there's a tendency for people to put these hard cases into that possible UIP category, even though the possible UIP category in 2011 was actually very well defined. But there's a tendency to shove it in there, which would induce, introduce some heterogeneity there. 
But if you actually look at these indeterminate for UIP cases, at least the sparse data that we have, there's a suggestion that they tend to actually follow more with the inconsistent with UIP cases, that is the alternative non-IPF diagnosis cases, than the possible UIP pattern. Here's an example taken from the literature, and this is from the, the, the Fleischner white paper. And so this is a case of a lot of ground glass, but a lot of reticulation as well. So it, there's not a lot of pure ground glass in there. Uh, the distribution is also somewhat odd, definitely not peripheral predominant. There's a suggestion of maybe even diffuse axial, diffuse zonal distribution. And on top of it, there's actually even a suggestion of some superimposed mosaic attenuation as well. So what do you do with it? I don't know. I mean, these findings aren't so florid that you would immediately jump to that, that alternative non-IPF diagnostic category, right? But it certainly doesn't look like UIP. It certainly doesn't look like probable UIP. So now we actually have a category to put this into rather than trying to pigeonhole into something where it doesn't belong. So a very sparse data out there. This is University of Chicago data. Uh, if you look at the, the bottom two rows there, in patients who we scored HRCTS indeterminate for UIP, if you look at the pathological yield there, so that, that second column there is UIP and histopathology, you'll see that it follows very closely with the former inconsistent with UIP pattern. So just over half of patients had UIP and pathology. And then as you would expect, the patients who had a probable UIP pattern, possible or probable UIP pattern, their diagnostic yield of UIP followed very closely with UIP, around 90%. And if you look at patients older than 60, it was almost exactly the same. Possible probable UIP versus UIP pattern on HRCT. So uh, it doesn't make sense to combine indeterminate UIP with possible or probable UIP. In fact, if you're going to do anything, if you, if you want to simplify the diagnostic criteria, it would probably make sense to combine indeterminate and the inconsistent with UIP. Again, now the now known as the alternative non-IPF diagnostic categories, and then combine the probable UIP category and the UIP category on CT, given their similarities in diagnostic yield. We're not quite there yet, I don't think. You know, obviously there's other things other than diagnosis. There's, um, there's you know, response to therapy. There's uh, patient prognosis. These things are all important as well, right? So I don't think that we should throw the baby out with the bathwater at this point, just start combining things. Uh, but if you were to combine, that would be the logical way to do it. Okay, so I'm, I'm tempted to click on this little, that little blue thing on the bottom, because um, that actually is my short little discussion on UIP, because I love UIP, I told you, like UIP is where I shine, where I'm like almost always right, but I'm not gonna go there uh, for, for the sake of time. Um, I think that's a little bit outside of the, the realm of the, the purpose of this talk. So let's just wrap it up. Um, I think the new classification system is actually a improvement on the previous classification system, for again, for multiple reasons shown here. So possible UIP, now we're calling it probable UIP because again, it better reflects the diagnostic ramifications of this imaging pattern. Inconsistent with UIP, now we're calling it an alternative non-IPF diagnostic category to get away from that idea of this not being UIP and pathology because again, substantial minority of cases, up to half of these cases will be UIP and pathology. And then we now have the indeterminate for UIP category, which I think is great. At first. At first, I was a little humbled by it because it's the truth. It's the truth. One, one out of ten, one out of eight cases, it comes through, these cases come through my PAC system, and I throw up my hands. I have no idea what's going on. I don't know what this disease pattern is. And so now I don't have to feel bad about it. I can just say, well, it's indeterminate for UIP. That was an easy case, right? Anyways, thank you very much for your time. Um, uh, I'd like to actually thank Dr. Dr. Lynch here for, being, uh, for his mentorship. And uh, if you have time, follow me on Twitter, okay? Thank you very much.